Today we're going to be looking at nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. NMR spectroscopy is the most commonly used technique for determining the structure of an organic compound. Useful for identifying the hydrocarbon skeleton to which the functional group is attached. It has small amount required, it's non-destructive, and large amounts of information can be obtained, like number of the protons in the molecule, relative positions in the molecule, different nuclei also can be measured, like carbon, boron, and phosphorus. Proton NMR allows the qualitative and quantitative characterization of the different types of hydrogens in the molecule. Carbon NMR identifies the carbons of the skeleton. A spinning charge such as the nucleus of 1H or 13C generates a magnetic field. This magnetic field generated by a nucleus of a spin plus one half is opposite in direction from that generated by a nucleus of spin minus one half. The distribution of nuclear spins is randomly in the absence of an external magnetic field. An external magnetic field represented by H0 causes nuclear magnetic moments to align parallel and anti-parallel to applied field. The frequency of absorbed electromagnetic radiation is proportional to the energy difference between the two nuclear spins states, which is proportional to the applied magnetic field. The frequency of absorbed electromagnetic radiation is different from different elements and for different isotopes of the same element. NMR is concerned with change in the direction of spin orientation, called nuclear magnetic resonance, as a result of the absorption of radio frequency radiation. The frequency of absorbed electromagnetic radiation for a particular nucleus, such as proton or carbon, depends on the molecular environment of the nucleus, the electronic environment. Nuclear shielding. If all the positions were exposed to the same magnetic field, they would absorb at the same frequency. Actually, when a molecule is subjected to a magnetic field, the bonding electrons circulate in such a way as to generate additional weak magnetic fields of their own. In general, these new magnetic fields oppose to the large fixed magnetic field, which has the effect of partially shielding the underlying nucleus. The greater the shielding, the lower the frequency required to produce resonance. Chemical shift is a measure of the degree to which a nucleus in a molecule is shielded. Protons in different environments are shielded to greater or lesser degrees. They have different chemical shifts. Reference standard, highly symmetrical tetramethyl silane, protons of which are more highly shielded than the protons of most other organic compounds. In this chart, we can see how upfield in means increasing the shielding and it's closer to zero ppms whereas downfield, which is the decreased shielding, goes into higher ppms. Trimethylsilane is used as a standard reference because its ppms are equal to zero. Electromagnetic substituents decrease the shielding of methyl groups. Here we have a series of atoms that have different electronegativities. We can see that the higher the electronegativity, usually we're gonna have PPMs are more on the downfield region of the spectrum. The effect is cumulative. For example, if we have one chloron with respect to three chlorons, the electronegativity of the atoms is going to add up and it's going to bring the molecule to more downfield environments. Protons attached to sp2 hybridized carbons are less shielded than those attached to sp3 hybridized carbons. Therefore, Aromatic rings tend to have to be more positioned into the downfield region. The information that we can get from the proton and MR spectra are the number of signals, how many different types of hydrogens in the molecule, the position of the signals or the chemical shift, which means what types of hydrogens we have, the relative areas under the curve or the integration, which means how many hydrogens of each type we have, and also the splitting pattern, how many neighboring hydrogens we have. If we analyze the position of the signals or the chemical shift, that it means what types of hydrogen, we can have different effects. In this, we show the charts of general, of general structural protons, whereas we can see primary, secondary, and tertiary carbons with respect to aromatic, with respect to allyl protons, with respect to benzyl, chlorides, bromides, and alcohols. This chart is a little bit more visual on how the spectrum might look. This is a general overview of how it would look. In reality, 
some other variables can be taken into consideration, and there could be exceptions. Here we show four molecules that we're going to use in this presentation as our reference. Cyclohexane, which is the first molecule, has only one type of signal, even though it has a series of different protons. Two, three dimethylbutene is shown in the second molecule. The symmetry also gives it only one type of signal overall in the molecule. The third molecule is benzene, which also has only one type of hydrogen and therefore we're just going to see one signal. Fourth molecule has two different types of protons. The ones that come from the aromatic ring, the ones that come from the methyl groups. So we're gonna have two different types of protons considering the para position of the molecule. Here we show the different types of protons and other molecules that are halogenated. Here we can see that in the first example, we have symmetry all over the, all over the place. So we're just gonna have one type of, molecule, of signal. In the second case, we have this brominated molecule that is going to generate two different types of signals. The third one is a molecule that will generate three types of signals. The fourth one is going to generate two different types of signals belonging to the methyl groups and the methine in the middle. For the following molecule, we're going to be generating four different signals as well. Whereas for this dihalogenated molecule, which is the second, we're going to generate two types of signals. One that belongs to the methylene in the middle, and two because of the symmetric resemblance of protons B. In the end, we're going to have this molecule that is going to generate three different types of signals. One that comes from the methyl, one that comes from the methylene with the chlorine atom attached to it, both in the ortho position, and lastly, the one that belong to the aromatic group. The integration will tell us the relative areas under each signal, how many hydrogens we have. So from analyzing the first molecule, brominated molecule, we can see that we have three signals, A, B, and C. A has three protons, B has two, and C has two. The ratio is going to be three, two, two, and this is how we're going to be able to see it in the spectrum. In the next example, we have a symmetrical molecule where the CH3s both have the same type of protons, and we have one in the middle. So this is going to generate six protons for signal A and one proton from signal B. The ratio will be six to one. So we can then integrate this into our previously studied molecules, and we can see that cyclohexanes will have 12 protons just from one signal. That will be the same case for our second molecule. And in the case of the benzene ring, we're going to have six protons that will come from the same molecule. In the last example, we're going to have six protons that come from the two methylenes para to each other. And we're going to have four protons that will come from the benzene ring. Our first brominated molecule will have three equivalent methyl signals. They will integrate for nine and they will only generate one signal. Our second brominated molecule will have two different signals, one that will integrate for the three protons from the methyl group, and a second one that will integrate for two protons from the methylene. This will be the same case in the, our third molecule, where we're going to have two different two proton signals belonging to B and C. Whereas for the last chlorinated molecule, we're going to have two protons that will integrate for six and one that will integrate for one. In this case, we're going to have four different signals, each of them integrating for the type of proton that it has, three, three, two, and one. The second molecule will have only two signals, four that will belong to B and two that will belong to A. And in our last example, we're going to have three signals, four that will integrate for the aromatic ring labeled as C, three from the methyl group labeled as A, and two from the methylene group labeled as B. When the protons are not structurally equivalent, a phenomenon called splitting is observed. The more common splitting patterns are singlets, doublets, triplets, quartets, and quintuplets. Splitting higher than this is actually called a multiplet. Splitting pattern follows the n plus 1 rule. 
n equals the number of the neighboring protons three bonds away. So in the first example, we don't have any couple hydrogens. So our proton is going to integrate for a sigmoid. In our second example, we have one proton, which is the blue, that is actually seeing three bonds away the proton in red. This will mean that n equals one. So the splitting pattern follows the n plus one, which will make a doublet or a, or a signal that would split in two. The space between these two sig signals is called the J coupling constant. In the third example, we have one proton blue looking at two red protons. This will make a pattern that's called a triplet, following the n plus one rule. And finally, we have a proton blue that's looking at three red protons. This will generate a quartet. In general, n equivalent neighboring hydrogens will split a proton signal into an n plus one Pascal pattern. The neighboring is no more should be no more than three bonds away. Here we have a general overview of how the singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, and quintet are going to look in the spectrum. We will look at some examples following this slide. N must be equivalent neighboring hydrogens to give rise to the Pascal splitting pattern. If the neighbors are not equivalent, then you will see a complex pattern or a complex multiplet. Note, the alcohol hydrogen OH usually does not split neighboring hydrogen signals, nor is it split. Normally a singlet of integration one between one to 5.5 ppm, and this is very. So following our examples, we see that cyclohexanes, it's going to generate a singlet. Same for our second molecule and our benzene molecule in third. For the case of the aromatic signal, we're also going to be looking at two different types of singlets. In the case of the first brominated, we're going to see nine protons that will, and the shape of the signal is going to be a singlet. In the second molecule, we're going to have some variation. So we're going to have three, three protons in A looking at two protons in the CH2. The N plus, plus one rule gives us a triplet. So three protons that will be in a triplet shape. In the case of B, we have two protons that are looking at the neighbor three protons. So N plus one equals four, meaning that this will make a quartet. Our third molecule will have three protons that will be seen through a triplet. Two protons that is going to be complex because the B signal is going to be looking actually at five protons. So N plus one equals six. This could be called a sextet, but in the context of this presentation, we'll just call it a complex and C will develop a triplet. In the case of the last molecule, the six protons will generate a doublet, which is going to be looking at the proton B, which is only one. And in the case of this one proton, we're going to be looking at the septet. For the first ruminated molecule, we're gonna have a combination of different signals, three protons that will look as a triplet, three protons that will look as a doublet, two protons that will generate a complex uh, signal and one proton that will generate another complex signal. For the second one, we have two protons generate a, quint a quintet and four protons generate a triplet. The chlorinated molecule will generate three protons that will see a singlet, two protons that will look like a singlet and four protons that will look also kind of like a singlet. And last but not least, we, we generate we generated the ethanol or how the ethanol would look. For the case of A, we're going to see three protons from the methyl group looking at two neighboring ones that will generate a triplet. The B signal methylene is going to look, it's going to be two protons looking at three from the methyl group and the OH doesn't count as we discussed before. So this is going to generate a quartet. The C, which generates the OH, is going to generate a singlet. Here we present all the NMRs from the, follow from the previous studied compounds. Cyclohexane brings only one signal into a very upfield region of the spectrum. Same is true for 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene. Benzene will also generate only a singlet molecule, but since it's an aromatic, in the aromatic region, we're going to be more on the downfield region of the spectrum. 
For the case of p xylene, we're going to generate two different molecules. One that it's up downfield that will integrate for the methyl groups. And we're going to generate one signal that integrates in the aromatic region. Terbutyl bromide will generate nine protons, and it's going to be a singlet in a very downfield region of the spectrum. Ethyl bromide will generate one triplet and one quartet. The atom that is more closest to the halogen is going to generate the signal more downfield around 3.5, whereas the, the atom that's farther from the bromine will generate the more downfield signal. One bromopropane will generate a triplet, two triplets, and a complex. Following the same rule, it's going to be atom C, which is going to be more on the downfield region, more on the 3.5 ppms, whereas the farther away, like A, is going to be more on the upfield region, closer to zero. Here we can see isopropyl chloride as well, two different signals a doublet and a septet and we can see also the proxim we can see we can also correlate the position on the ppm considering the position closer or farther to the halogen atom two bromobutane will generate four different signals and here is this the first example where we will see merging of the signals so our atom label as d is going to generate a complex that's going to be around 4 ppm. Our atom A, which is the farthest from the atom, is going to generate a triplet that is going to be more closer to zero on the upfield region. The rest of the signals will appear around 1.5 and 2, and they will stack on top of each other. O methyl benzene chloride will generate three signals that are very well split between one between the other all of them generating singlets. Ethanol will generate three different signals. And as you can see, the OH doesn't affect how the integration of the carbon hydrogen signals occur. So we'll just see B as the OH appearing at around 2.5 as a singlet. Whereas the other signals are just going to look at each other without looking at the OH. Ethyl benzene will also take into consideration which of the atoms is closer to the aromatic ring. So our CH2 molecule is going to appear more on the downfield region, closer to 2.5. Paradiethyl benzene will be another molecule that is symmetrical. So we're going to have only three different types of signals. The closer they are to the aromatic region, the more downfield they will appear. Analyze this spectrum and make your conclusions yourselves. 2-bromo-2-methylbutane will generate three different types of signals. We're going to have an overlap again of over B and C. di n propyl ether will generate three different types of signals. This is a symmetrical molecule. Analyze this spectrum and Look for yourself which signals are going to be present in the spectrum. Take into consideration the proximity to the most electronegative atom. One propanol is also going to generate four different types of signals. Make your conclusions about the following spectrum and take into consideration that the OH signal will not take participation into the splitting pattern. Here we present also the NMR of a benzaldehyde. It's important to note that aldehydes and carboxylic acids, protons, will have the most downfield values on the PPM region of the spectrum, almost appearing at 10. Compare this to the aromatic region, which is usually around 7 to 8. You can visit the following webpage in order to generate different types of molecules, generate their proton NMRs, and study them yourselves. Carbon NMR takes into consideration the abundance of carbon, which is 1.1% out of the carbons. 
It takes into consideration the number of signals, how many different types of carbons, the splitting, the number of hydrogens on the carbon, the chemical shift, which is the hybridization of carbon by sp, sp2, or sp3, and the chemical shift, which is the environment. This NMR spectroscopy is easier to interpret than proton, but it's as valuable as proton. Here we show the carbon spectrum for 2-bromobutane. You can see that the range of the PPMs is wider from 0 to 200, but it takes into consideration the same rules as before. We will not have a splitting pattern in this case. We're just going to have single signals appearing. And we take into consideration which carbon is closer to the most electronegative atom. So in this case, carbon D, which is attached to bromine, is probably the carbon that's around 55. We follow the same rule of proximity and we can predict which one of the following carbons is the correct 